when we begin, only questions allowed about physics. All right. Now you have to wait until tomorrow. Well, so welcome. Good morning. I hope you had a nice weekend. Uh, so this is w where we are, crossing an equator. We have three weeks behind and exactly three weeks ahead. Uh, lucky us, lucky you, we have no special celebration routine for that. So <clears throat> that's what we talked about last week. We finished this problem. I just want to remind you that calculating normal force for a car making a turn on a banked surface is different from calculating the normal force for a car or cart or any object sliding down a surface. And uh, we have calculated the optimal speed for this car. Optimal means when car travels at that speed, there is no friction needed to prevent car from sliding up or down the ramp. And, uh, well, what does this expression tell us? When the car starts traveling faster, it should move away from a center. The radius should increase accordingly. And uh, when the car travels slower, again, the radius decreases. It goes down the ramp, find a new radius. And uh, there's one more example we have to do. Well, <clears throat> this physics is being used for designing uh, rails and tracks for trains or, uh, you know, metros, uh, coaches, because for each turn, they've been calculated that optimal speed, which doesn't require any additional force to keep uh, the train from skidding away. However, as we know, sometimes, by some reason, the conductor doesn't follow those rules, travels faster than allowed it, and uh, a crash might happen, and actually, happened last year, a couple of crashes because of speeding up. And the road is always banked to make an adjustment for that particular optimal speed for the train to make that turn. Well, <clears throat> that's the last example to consider related to circular motion. This is a no. Carnival ride, and I have a model of that. So the question is, what is the physics behind this particular phenomenon? So let's see. This is... So this is the model. In the carnival ride, uh, people stand first on, well, some support, and then support goes away, and they remain pressed to the wall. Well, um, I have a sponge instead of a, an actual little person. So if I spin it, and I pr place this sponge, press it to the wall, what's going to happen? Nothing, it falls down. Well, 
you should start drawing pre body diagram for this sponge, for this object, because it's all about forces. Uh, what forces act on this sponge? Well, of course, there's force of gravity. And when the wall is pressing on this sponge, there has to be normal force acting on it. But what force would prevent it from sliding down? What do you think? What force would be strong enough to prevent it from sliding down along the wall? Anybody? What do you think? Yes? So what force? What force? What is the name of that force which is supposed to prevent this sponge or object from sliding down this wall? Yes. Are you asking or saying? Friction. Well, what else could it be? We have in our mind a list of the forces. Gravity taken already. It actually moves it down. Yes. Can I hear you? Uh, there is no such force like centripetal or centrifugal. This is just a term which represents the product of two variables, mass and centripetal acceleration. The actual force is supposed to have a source, uh, centrifugal or centripetal force has no source. It's a mathematical abstract. A source for force of gravity is what? What is the source, an actual object? responsible for the existence of the force of gravity acting on the sponge. What you say? An actual object. We remove that object, we destroy it, and force of gravity disappears as well. What would I do without my own cables? Just asking, just curious. Oh, sorry, the depot was locked this morning. So it, so. Of course, it's always somebody else's fault. That's why I always have my own cables, my own computers, everything my own. So, coming back to physics from real life. <clears throat> what is that actual object responsible for the existence of the force of gravity acting on this sponge? Someone has to say something, anything. It's, a, it's Monday, we have to start, you know, getting into our routine, thinking, conversing. The sponge experiences the existence of that force we call force of gravity, and because every force has a source, and that source always a specific object, there has to be some specific object which is responsible for the existence of the force of gravity acting on this sponge, right? Yeah. Mass is a feature of the sponge. It's a parameter which describes, on one hand, how much stuff is being stuffed in it, on another hand, how dense is it, on the third hand, how strong is that force of gravity which is acting on this sponge from that object which is responsible for the existence of this force of gravity acting on this sponge from that object? Hmm? Are you asking or telling? To say it? Earth, yes. The actual object which pulls on everything down with the force which has a name, force of gravity, and has magnitude equal to product mass times acceleration due to gravity. The Earth is responsible for the existence. The Earth, the planet. Now, what is the object, an actual object responsible for the existence of the normal force 
acting on this sponge. What is that object? I just not, I mean, how do we call it? Hmm? You can say the red, you can say the bucket, you can say the wall, but you have to say something. You can't say normal force exists because I have no idea why. That would be wrong. We should have by now an idea for each force why it exists. And uh, now gravity pulls down, what would be the force prevents it from sliding down? Hmm? Friction, that's the only force left. We cannot see any springs, so no elastic force. We don't see any strings, so no tension. So we go through the list of forces, gravity, check, normal, check, elastic, no. Tension, no. What else do we know? Friction, yes. When two objects interact and move relative to each other, force of friction acting between those objects. But evidently, that force of friction is not strong enough to prevent it from sliding down. So the question is, how could we increase the force of friction. Well, <clears throat> I've got my mysterious liquid here. Not blood. Oh, I say so. So, we know when things wet, the adhesion increases. So now it doesn't slide down. It remains attached to the wall until what? What's going to happen if I slow it down? Slower and slower and slower, and eventually it slides down. So, first of all, there has to be some critical speed. It should spin fast enough, and uh, of course our goal is to calculate that critical speed and in general understand how it works. Actually, who knows, maybe I'm going to use it again. So by now, everybody already should have a free body diagram drawn, because we just said very clearly what forces act on that sponge, gravity, normal, and friction. So, of course, <clears throat> we have to take a mental picture, a photograph, because it's moving. We just have to draw a situation for one specific instant. Um, <clears throat> and we can draw two pictures. Uh, we can imagine what we see when we look from above and what we see when we look straight aside. When we look from above, you know, we just see a circle, a sponge like this. and. Uh, we don't see force of gravity because it should point into the screen. We don't see normal. Uh, we, we see normal force because actually it points like this. The wall presses. And we don't see friction because it should oppose gravity. Well, that's it. If we draw a side view, <coughs> we see a, a bucket like that, a sponge. And now we can see gravity. We can see that friction, and again, we can see normal force. So the side view actually more useful in terms of forces, but the side view doesn't show the trajectory. The trajectory of this sponge is a circle. So the top view shows the trajectory. And uh, one more arrow is missing, which represents acceleration yeah, because when we talk about forces we will have to use Newton's second law anyway so we have to show all forces 
acceleration. Now, <clears throat> when the object is not moving relative to the wall, that means that frictional force and force of gravity cancel each other out. They must have the same magnitude. So I'll write it like this. Force of friction should have the same magnitude as force of gravity. Now, this is basically a Newton's second law written relative to the vertical axis. And uh, if we write the Newton's law relative to horizontal axis, we should say that the normal force should be equal to or the magnitude of the normal force here should be equal to the product of mass times centripetal acceleration. Well, now what's going to happen if we slow the system down? How does it affect and what uh, the system and uh, what physical variable changes? Well, speed is a part of the centripetal acceleration. So, when the speed decreases, that decreases the normal force. All right? Now we have to remember something about force of friction. First of all, when object is not moving relative to the surface, that friction has a special name, static friction. And for the force of static friction, we know that it may have any value between, well, zero and maximum. And maximum value is proportional to the normal force. So when we slow the system down, we decrease normal force. And by doing that, we decrease the maximum value of this friction which system can provide. So eventually, Friction just becomes not as strong anymore as force of gravity. So the critical regime, critical value, is reached when maximum friction is equal to mg. If we move even slower, that it maximum will be less than mg, and friction will not be able to provide the force strong enough to compensate mg and the object starts sliding down. So now we're done. So on one hand, the maximum value of the force of static friction equals to coefficient of static friction times normal force. On another hand, that normal force supposed to be equal to the product of mass times speed squared divided by the radius. And this is that critical speed, that critical speed we are looking for. When the bucket spins faster, no problem. The sponge remains pressed, not sliding down. Well, this is my lowercase m, which getting canceled. So we can calculate. The value for that critical speed. That's it. By Increasing the coefficient of friction by moistening the sponge, we're decreasing the critical speed. The dry sponge still could be pressed, but I would have to spin this bucket much, much faster. And I cannot do it with my hand. I would have to use a special device to spin it as fast as needed. Any questions? Because we are done with circular motion. That was the last example related to circular motion. And uh, we have to start the new topic. And uh, uh, 
when we need to solve a problem, when we need to analyze any phenomenon, we never get the solution in all details immediately. At first we get a general idea, a general direction. How should we think about the situation? Then we may kind of see some big areas like, okay, first use the law of conservation of mechanical energy, then use the law of conservation of linear momentum. It's like building a building. At first, we're going to do a foundation, then the frame, then the roof, then we will start doing interior design. And only then we can go through all the details of the solution, of the analysis. And we have no time for that. So <clears throat> we cannot go through all specific details of the reasoning behind all equations we have to use. But I find it important to at least lay down general steps, general ideas, which lead to those final equations, which we will be using afterwards for analyzing specific situations. And the fundamental idea, number one, is this. When we talk about a large object, we can always think of it as composed of many, many, many small objects. And if we know how to describe what's happening to each individual small object, we can then make a jump a leap to the description of what's happening to the large object. So <clears throat> when a large object is moving in space with time, Sometimes all parts of this object travel parallel to each other. So we can choose one single point and look at it, and that will describe the motion of all the points. Usually we pick up a center of mass, and that's it. But that's not always the case. We call it translational motion. If we talk about rotational motion, in that case, the trajectories of different points are different, still similar, but different. And we will have to analyze the motion of each individual point. The problem is we know everything about a uniform circular motion when speed remains constant. But we don't know yet how to describe the motion of an object when speed changes. So that's our immediate goal. And, uh, yeah, if you read the textbook, people use two different spelling for the same object, disk. So <clears throat> what do we need to do to describe the motion of a small object when circular motion is not uniform? Where is my click? Oh, okay. My clicker. So I'm going to show you what is happening, just in case. Visualization always helps to boost our imagination. So this is what's happening. It doesn't even make the whole circle, but still, the motion is circular. You know, that's the center of the circle because I hold it here. I gave it a push and it stops. So the question is, <coughs> the speed of this object I have a certain expectation about the answers to this question. And my expectation was almost correct. Try one more time. Oh. 
44. No, I'm not sure. Um, well, I'm not sure if you really think so or you're just trying to mess with me. In that case, be, be careful. But if we use our eyes, we can see that initially the object was moving because I gave it a push. So initial velocity was not zero. And final velocity is zero because it doesn't move anymore. So when velocity changes from not zero to zero, how do we call it? Slowing down. That's why my expectation was having a 100% correct answers. <clears throat> well, I'll try one more time later. Now, uh, let's do some physics. When I gave it a push, after that, after that, my hand doesn't touch it anymore. So there is, of course, force of gravity and normal forces, which we cannot see because they, well, point into the screen or out of the screen. The only force which is responsible for slowing down is, again, force of friction here. And uh, we can write that according to Newton's second law. The magnitude of the force of friction should be equal to the magnitude of uh, We kind of say, we should say horizontal acceleration. Now, how does acceleration point, actual acceleration? Well, we still should draw an arrow which rep represents centripetal acceleration. It doesn't go anywhere. Force of tension doesn't disappear. Force of tension is still acting on this object. So if we have two forces, tension and friction, tension and friction, the net force should point, well, something like this. That's just a tail to a head rule. This is arrow, an arrow which represents the net force, which means acceleration, which is equal to net force divided by mass, should point in the same direction. So the acceleration should have two components. One component is the same old centripetal acceler acceleration, which is responsible for the change in the direction of the velocity. But now, the second component is not zero. It is responsible for change in the speed the object is slowing down. And this acceleration, always tangent to trajectory. We can draw the trajectory. It's a part of a circle like this. So that's why this acceleration also has a name, tangential acceleration. And that's how people note it, tangential. And this acceleration responsible for the rate of change of the speed, speed of the magnitude of velocity. So technically, an official definition of this acceleration should look like this. The change in the magnitude over time. Well, of course, assume that time approaches zero. Well, <coughs> and in general now, the actual acceleration should be equal to, oh, The hypotenuse of the triangle, which is composed by the components of the acceleration, the actual acceleration, tangential acceleration, centripetal acceleration, the right angle. And that's all we can say so far. So the main point is when 
this motion is not uniform when speed changes the actual acceleration now has two components one which we have learned before the centripetal which points to the center and second is a new one tangential which is responsible for how fast speed change now so <clears throat> The issue is this. Is that if we talk about the motion of a large solid object, and we have to break it down in many, many small parts, we have to apply the same equations for all those parts. Then we have to summarize everything and uh, unfortunately, many variables which we use to describe what's happening to this individual part depend on the location. For example, they may have different radius. Now please take a mental picture because I will ask you a question about this situation, again, with the same expectation. So I have two objects sitting on a turntable, and I make it move. See? I call it one and two. Please tell me what you think. So you saw the experiment, the pictures on the screen, the question is about distance traveled, those are possible answers. Jorvi says. That's a question number three, correct? Correct. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Total number changes 75. The system has some inertia. It, you know, you enter, it goes, I don't know where the server is and comes back. So we still have a distribution, which is really, really strange to me. I cannot explain why would someone answer something different. Because it's all about straightforward application of a definition of a Distance. Distance is the length of the trajectory. So this is the length of the trajectory for the first object. And this is the length of the trajectory for the second. And if I look at them straight, I can see this distance is longer than this one. It's not a tricky question. So you should think uh, why would you say something different? Just who knows? Maybe because of the same reason you would make a similar mistake on the f upcoming exam. Well, anyway, <coughs> distance different. Distance over time is speed. The speed is different. Speed squared over radius, acceleration. Acceleration is different. We have to find something they have in common. Otherwise, we will not be able to describe the motion of this object as a whole. So, please, anybody, venture an idea. When these two objects move, like in this experiment, in circles, the radius is different, the distance traveled is different. What is the same? Yes. Angle. Yes, absolutely. 
So, yes? Time. If we can't find that common variables, we will not be able to move ahead in our reasoning. But now we can. We just have to switch our way we describe the motion from using linear variables like distance, displacement, velocity, acceleration, to angular variables. Angle, well, that's a everyday term. In physics, we should call it angular displacement. Yeah. It dis <coughs> when it travels in a circle, we can always choose direction from which we measure angles, and normally that's positive x direction. And then we can measure angle and how it changes in time. And that angle we call angular displacement, but also just angle. Angular displacement over time should be describing how fast angle changes, and we should call it angular velocity. When velocity changes, we call it acceleration. Now it's going to be angular acceleration. But first, again, we have to mathematically describe that new physical quantity, angular displacement. And uh, there are two definitions of that. Number one, you take complete circle and divide it in 360 equal parts. Well, I can draw 360. If I do that, how do we call that little part? A degree. But a degree doesn't belong to international system of units. It's convenient unit, but doesn't belong to international system of units. To international system of units belongs a radian. How do we define it? Well, that's an official definition. If we, if we draw a circle, Imagine it's a circle, and uh, we find an, an angle such that the length of the arc is equal to the radius. This angle has a name, one radian. That's an official definition of it. Well, mathematically, We write it in the form of a fraction. So it doesn't have to be always the same uh, length. Any length divided by the radius gives the value of that angle in radians. And as a result of that, actually, uh, we have a Convergent factor between radians and uh, degrees pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. And we know that. Nothing new. Now, of course, we can move forward. We can introduce other variables. <coughs> First, names. For an object, which makes the same angle over same time. Angular velocity is constant. And in that case, we can introduce quantity called a period. A period is time for the subject to make one whole revolution. That's a period. When we keep spinning it, we can count how many revolutions it makes in a second. That's what we call frequency. And then uh, for, <coughs> for each part of this, for each point particle of this large object, we can introduce the speed, which is distance traveled over time, and relate it with angular speed. That's what we're going to do right now. So <coughs> period. A standard variable is capital T. So how do we calculate the period? Well, if we make revolutions, we count how many revolutions it makes. 
and uh, how much time it makes to make this number of revolutions. So time over number of revolutions gives the time for one revolution. That's the period. The frequency tells us how many revolutions is done per second. So that's the reciprocal revolutions per second. We can see actually that frequency and period are related, inversely proportional. Now, <coughs> speed, well, that should be equal to the distance traveled over time. Angular speed, and the standard letter for angular speed is a Greek letter omega. And some people call it weird W, because W looks like this, with ends out. So you bend the ends of this letter in, and it becomes omega. So by a definition, it should be equal to the angular displacement over time. But we can now make a transition and make uh, f between angular and the linear variables, because angular displacement is equal to linear distance traveled over radius and then over time. And this pressure distance over time equals speed. We get first important relationship between linear and angular variables. Connection. And, uh, <clears throat> well, We can do some more simple algebra, get some more connections, more relationships. They all are here. They all start from the definition of radian and then from definitions of other variables. What is the period? What is the frequency? What is the angular velocity? Now we have to say a word about directions. We know according to our standard agreement, if we point x axis to the right, all vectors which point to the right have positive components relative to this axis. All vectors which point to the left have negative components. Now, angular variables also can be positive or negative. We have to define when the component of angular displacement or angular velocity or ang angular acceleration is positive when it's negative. So this is a standard agreement. When the angle is measured counterclockwise from positive x direction, <coughs> that angle is defined as positive. When angle is measured clockwise, negative. Well, angle over time velocity, so the same agreement works for velocity. When object spins counterclockwise, angular velocity is positive. When object spins clockwise, angular velocity is negative. And now the trickiest part, we also assign vectors. But we cannot assign vector which points up or down, left and right. So we assign a vector which points perpendicularly to the motion to the screen if we look straight at it. For, for a positive angle or for a positive angular velocity, we assign a vector which points out of the screen perpendicularly to the screen. That's an agreement, a definition. And for a negative vector, for a negative velocity, or a negative displacement, angular displacement, we assign a vector which points away from us into the screen. Standard symbol to represent a vector which points out of the screen is a little circle with a dot. It's like you're looking at the airhead of an arrow. And if you held an arrow, an actual arrow in your hands, it has feathers 
at the end. And this symbol kind of represents what you would see if you've been looking at the end of an arrow, a bow arrow, like feathers. So these, is, uh, these are standard symbols, which represent vectors perpendicular to a certain surface. And uh, in physics, that third direction actually represents the third axis, x, y. And now we kind of talk about the third one, z. So when vector points parallel to z, it's positive. And when vector points anti-parallel, opposite to z, it's negative. Well, anyway, those are just agreements. They don't require understanding. They require memorizing. That's it, like every definition. Now, also, we can make a, an extra step. Remember, when objects speeding up, velocity and acceleration have the same direction. When objects slowing down, velocity and acceleration have opposite directions. Of course, the same stays correct for angular variables. So when object rotates faster and faster, angular velocity and angular acceleration point in the same direction. When it slows down, they are opposite. Nothing new. We're just adding one word, angular. Well, this is a summary of everything related to uh, kinematics of rotational motion, almost everything. <laughs> Let's do an example. So this is what's happening. So far, most of the examples are related to uniform circular motion, but we will move on eventually to motion with constant acceleration. So the length of this string, which is equal to the radius of the trajectory, equals a half of a meter. And the mass of this ball equals 50 grams point of five of kilogram. And uh, it makes three revolutions in two seconds. Now we have variables which we can use to represent those quantities. Number of revolutions is three. Time, two seconds. Well, sometimes people write that kind of unit revolutions. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. It's just a counting number, one, two, three. Well, but now, first of all, we can calculate immediately the period, two thirds revolutions per second. Uh, uh, what did I do? No, no, sorry. I wrote the wrong letter. It should be T over N, T over N, 2 over 3 uh, seconds per revolution. But we don't write revolutions. Normally, we just write seconds. That's it. The frequency. Now, for the frequency, if you remember the slide, people use several different variables. You never know uh, what variable will be used in the textbook or in the problem. So there is a lowercase n, Greek letter nu, and uh, very commonly, the lowercase f frequency, which is number of revolutions per second, or one of a, or a period. 3 over 2, or 1.5. And now, when we write a unit for frequency, we don't write revolutions. Again, we just write 1 over s, 1 over second. Or, if you use if, um, exponents in mathematics, 1 over something can be written as a negative exponent. Or, the frequency also has its own unit 
earth. So and all these units are equivalent, yes. Say again. No, that's frequency. The number of revolutions per second is a frequency by definition, a period of time for one revolution. So if we know how much time it takes for 10 revolutions, we take that time and divide it by 10. That's what we do. We measure time for several revolutions, and that time divided in the number of revolutions, that gives time for one revolution. And that what we call period. Where else can we find? Well, <clears throat> speed, angular speed. What can we do to get the speed? Well, speed is distance traveled over time. And we actually had a similar calculation done before. We know that it takes two seconds to make three whole revolutions. Distance traveled in one revolution has a name, circumference. And uh, to calculate the circumference, we just need to use an equation from geometry, two pi radius. Speed. Now, uh, how do we calculate the angular speed or angular velocity? Uh, actually, the problem doesn't specify if we spin it clockwise or counterclockwise, so we can pick it and make it positive or negative. But if we're calculating, cal calculating speed, we have two options. The option number one, we can use a relationship between angular and linear variables, or the option number two, we can use a definition. No matter how we do it, we should get the same number. So if we use a definition, what do we know? We know it makes three revolutions in two seconds. But now, we have to use the angular displacement and divide it by time. And angular, angular displacement equals what? Well, for one revolution, it's 360 degrees, but we cannot use degrees. Well, we could in certain problems. But in this situation, we have to stick to international system of units. So one whole revolution, 360 degrees, will be equal to two pi radians, two pi radians. That's for one revolution. And in two seconds, it actually makes three of those. So this is supposed to be angular speed in radians per second. And <coughs> when we're calculating frequency, we end up with hertz, one over a second. When we calculate angular speed, which in two weeks will also be called angular frequency. We keep both units, radians and second. And uh, you can see that this number, well, three times pi, two cancels, will be equal to this number. Because if it calculates speed and divide by the radius, we get exactly the same expression. So it doesn't matter how we find it. Whatever works for you. Where else can we calculate? Well, of course, we can uh, do what we've done before. Just quick review. Centripetal acceleration equals V squared over R. Or, for the sake of uh, practicing using angular variables, linear speed is related to angular speed. So we can replace the linear speed with the product of angular speed and radius from the very last equation on the left, V equals omega times R. And now we can rewrite 
the expression for centripetal acceleration using angular variables, which is good because this variable, angular speed, will be the same for all parts of a solid object, no matter if it's on the rim or closer, closer to the center. They all travel with exactly the same angular speed. They all travel with exactly different linear speed, but angular will be the same. And because this is a case when motion is uniform, that means speed remains constant, that new variable we talked about a little, tangential acceleration will be equal to zero because speed doesn't change. Only when speed changes, this variable would not be equal to zero. And soon we're gonna, we're gonna see how it works. Uh, and of course, the last possible calculation, tension. Where the, okay, force of tension, force of tension. And now, I don't want to write capital T for tension because capital T is already taken by the period. Or if I do write it, I have to use a different brain cell for that variable. One capital T represents the period, second capital T represents force of tension. I don't want to do that, it's too hard. That's why I use a different notation. Force of tension, F sub T will be equal to mass times centripetal acceleration. Any questions? <laughs> so now, when speed changes, like it was in this simple experiment, it stops, it changes. Well, technically we know what to do. So first of all, Angular velocity is angular displacement over time, and uh, we always assume that the time is tiny. Uh, then, when <coughs> when speed changes, angular velocity changes accordingly. When speed increases, angular velocity increases. When speed decreases, angular velocity decreases. So that means we can introduce that physical variable which tells the rate of change of angular velocity. And of course, it should be called angular acceleration. And the standard letter is Greek letter alpha for angular acceleration or epsilon. And different textbooks prefer different letters now we need to relate angular acceleration with, with, uh, with what? Well, with ten, ten, tangential one. So this is what we could do. Angular acceleration is equal to rate of change of uh, angular velocity, but angular velocity is equal to speed over the radius, and uh, we start from a simple example right here, you see, only one, only one <coughs> small object traveling, so we can We can treat the radius as a common factor for these speeds. Now, I know it's tricky, but uh, we, we have to keep track of what each variable represents. So in this expression, this letter V represents the magnitude of velocity. We call it speed. So we have to keep kind of this meaning in our memory, or we have to draw those vertical bars specifically. It doesn't matter how we do that. This ratio is what we called tangential acceleration. 
This ratio represents how fast speed changes in time. Well, technically, we don't need to know all the steps. We just need to know the result. Angular acceleration is directly related to tangential acceleration, not centripetal. <coughs> centripetal acceleration is directly related to angular speed. But angular acceleration, which tells us how fast angular velocity changes, is directly related to tangential acceler acceleration in a very similar manner, like angular velocity related to linear velocity. Omega equals V over R, alpha equals A over R. This is a standard relationship between different linear and ang angular variables. Now, what we do. What good about this expression? If instead of having only one small object, we have many, many of those, they all have the same angular acceleration. Omega is the same for all. Alpha is the same for all. So we can use these type of expressions to describe the motion of a large solid object. Unfortunately, we have to give up something else. So if you want to keep angular acceleration, uh, we have to rewrite our expressions in terms, in terms which on one hand make it more complicated. And this is what we do. We multiply everything by the radius because we want it to. Then we call this combination, and I'm not going to say how yet. We call it letter, tau. And then we call this combination a different letter, i, because they don't matter. This equation only represents the fact that for rotational motion of a solid object, we always can have variables related to the same acceleration. Now I want to talk about acceleration, and then we will talk about those variables. First, acceleration. So here you see two questions in one. First of all, well, you already read it. I'm going to show you an example of what's happening. It says red spot. I have to make it. This is the red spot in question. Come on. Now, we gave it a push. <laughs> Too strong. It only makes three revolutions. One, two. All right. The number of revolutions doesn't affect the answers. One, two, three. That's what happened. So the question number one, what type of the motion did you observe? And we know only two types, uniform or not uniform. And question number two, what can you say about the acceleration of that red spot? So <clears throat> you can start answering. Type of the motion. Well, I gave it a push. The initial angular <coughs> velocity was equal to 5 radians per second. And eventually, dot, 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 dot. Da, 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 da. The final angular velocity becomes equal to what number? Zero. Was it a uniform? No. If velocity changes, speed changes accordingly. If speed changes, this is a non-uniform circular motion. No tricks here. Now, how does acceleration point? Question number five. When object spins counterclockwise, according to our agreement, 
the angular velocity of that object is and you can finish this sentence with only three options positive zero negative so one object spins counterclockwise according to our agreement angular velocity is positive now is it speeding up or slowing down slowing down which means acceleration should be same or opposite opposite that's it that's how we have to reason through this part, uh, kind of question so angular velocity we call it positive but slows down hence angular acceleration should be opposite to angular velocity hence clockwise or negative if we want to use a specific vector assigned to angular velocity we have to draw this symbol which represents a vector pointing from the screen at you if you want to use a vector which represents the acceleration in that situation you have to use this symbol which represents a vector which points away from you into the screen and these are again just agreements rules they just have to be internalized they don't require understanding all right <clears throat> so this problem is a continuation of the experiment we gave a push it stops in three revolutions mathematically this problem is no different from a problem we've solved before we gave a push it stops we gave it a push it stops no difference we have solved the problem about the box sliding down and stuff and we know how to do that so we just have to apply exactly the same reasoning but we have to replace linear variables we used to use with angular variables accordingly instead of using velocity we use angular velocity linear displacement we replace it with angular displacement linear or tangential acceleration we replace it with angular acceleration so we have to use exactly the same mathematics we just have to use Greek letters instead does it make any difference mathematically no not at all so in this particular situation final angular speed is zero initial is five radians per second well <coughs> we have to keep an eye on units because we cannot mix units and often angles could get, could could be given in degrees and uh, acceleration or velocity is in radians if we use mixed units we just make a mathematical mistake in, in the end now and that is exactly a case here theta represents the displacement and uh, that displacement is given in revolutions well that's the magnitude of the displacement but we cannot use revolutions we have to use radians so what do we do well we know a conversion factor one revolution is equal to two pi radians so three times two six six pi radians that the angular displacement of this <coughs> turntable and now we can calculate acceleration zero equals five squared plus two times alpha times well it's displaced counterclockwise so displacement is positive six pi that's alpha and uh, because it decelerates yeah, we, we get negative acceleration which is 25 over 12 my brain 
races faster than my hands. 25 over 12 times pi. And that will be radians per second squared because it's angular acceleration. Any questions? Well, what else could we calculate, actually? Well, angular acceleration should be equal to final angular velocity minus initial angular velocity divided by time. So this number, which we just found, also should be equal to 0 minus 5 divided by time. We can calculate how much time did it take to to bring it to a stop. Exactly like we did it before for a box sliding down a I don't know, tabletop. All right, so now we're going to talk about those variables. First of all, <coughs> we know that to make a transition from a description for a single point to a description of a large object, we just have to use a summation. We have to add together everything related to all those points. So how do we do that? Very simple. We write an equation for a single point, and we add a symbol, the sum. We're assuming that we have so, so, so many tiny, 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 well, those are points, you know, dots, so many, and this summation runs over all of them. And the, the good thing about it is the angular acceleration is the same for all. So this angular acceleration now doesn't describe acceleration of a single point. This angular acceleration now describes the acceleration of the whole object. Now, these two variables require an additional analysis. First, the name, of course. If anything becomes important in physics, we name it. We call it torque, torque of a force. In my experiment with the little object attached to a string, friction stops it. So the torque of force of friction, this product, force times this distance, has been named the torque of force of friction. But it doesn't have to be friction. It could be my finger, applied force. It could have been something else, string, spring. Any force which is acting on a solid object might exert a certain torque, which is supposed to be equal to a product of force and some kind of a distance. And a second variable represents the sum of these products. We just call it a moment of inertia because it is related to Mass, it describes mass distribution inside this object. And uh, we'll talk about mass distribution tomorrow. So this is our leap from an equation for a single point to an equation for the whole object. If we have several forces acting on a solid object, each individual force should be responsible for the existence of that new quantity we call torque. And if we add all of them, all of them together, we should get what we used to call total or net. How do we find it? Well, we have to think about it. We have to go through specific situations. And this variable, well, it's not really important because it depends on the shape. Yeah. See? 
mass distribution. For different shape, it has to be a different expression. But we don't have to know how to derive those expressions. All we have to know those expressions. And all those expressions available online or on a screen or in a textbook or in the equation sheet. They depend on the shape. If you have a sphere, one equation. If you have a long rod, second equation. If you have a hollow disk, third equation. And we will talk about it. Now, of course, we have only two options to discuss. Number one, equilibrium. Number two, not equilibrium. When this variable net torque equals zero and an object is at rest, even if something is acting on it, we call it equilibrium. And that's going to be our immediate goal. Now we need to talk about how to calculate that individual torque expressed, exerted, generated by an individual force. And of course, we have to start from some physics. That's my favorite part, experiments. All right. Five kilogram weight, very heavy. And what we know about it We have to apply a certain critical force to make it move. So if I pull and pull and pull, it's not moving yet. So I have to apply, OK, about 16 newtons to make it move. That's the maximum value of a force of static friction, which I have to overcome. So we, now we know this number. And now I can play with this toy. Instead of applying a force directly to the subject, I can apply a force to a rod, which is touching the subject. For example, Probably better do it this way. All right. It's closer to 18 now. What's going to happen if I move it? I know that the force which makes this move is 16, always 16. So I have to apply a certain force here in order to generate 16 there. And I can see that every time that number is different. If I move my scale to a different location in order to generate the same 16 newtons here, I have to apply, well, in this situation, stronger force. Where else can I change? I can change the direction. Can I? Of course. <clears throat> so let's say. I pull on this string at a certain angle. 20 is not enough. 30 is not enough. All right, so it's about 60 newtons I have to generate here in order to generate the same 16 newtons here. 60, 16. So this simple experiment tells us that This rod rotates about that axis. The rotational effect of the force I am applying to this rod depends on the location 
and on the angle. How does it depend on the angle? Well, that's actually pretty simple. If I pull on this string, this force has two components. One component parallel to the rod. That component cannot move the rod perpendicularly. It's not responsible for rotation. Only this component, which is perpendicular to the rod, responsible for this rotation. And this component should be, well, equal to the value of this force if this force is applied perpendicularly to the rod. So this type of experiments immediately, immediately tell, tell me how to specify the way we're calculating torque. Yes. So if we have a if you have an object, a, s a large solid object, which may move about a specific axis, this axis, axis might be a physical axis or only in our mind, imaginary, doesn't really matter. If we apply a force to this object at a certain point, first of all, this point has a name, the point of application of a force. So we have two points here, the axis and the point of application, P, which means we can measure distance between these two points. Doesn't have any name. There's distance from an axis of rotation to the point of application of the force. Now what we do? We resolve or break yeah, the force into two components. One component has to be perpendicular or people call it Fy by some reason. One, one, one component has to be perpendicular to this distance. Second component is parallel. And the parallel component does not matter. It doesn't provide any rotational effect. Only perpendicular component matters. So this is what we do. If we multiply these numbers, this product is named, defined as a torque of this force acting on this object relative to that axis. This is a full statement, yeah. full definition. Torque of that force acting on this object at this point relative to that axis. Done. That's how we calculate magnitude. What about definition of uh, di direction? Well, of course, we don't invent new definitions. We still use the same definitions. If the rotational action of a torque relative to axis counterclockwise, we call it positive, like in this example. If the rotational action of this torque about the axis is clockwise, it's negative. And if we have many, many forces acting on an object, each individual force is responsible for the existence of its own torque. Some of those might be positive, some of those might be negative. We can calculate each according to the definition which we just have. If we add them up all together, the result has a name net torque. And if net torque equals zero and the object is at rest, that's what we call it. Equilibrium. And now, starting from this slide, you can solve any problem on static equilibrium. Well, first, let's exercise just in calculating torques. <clears throat> this is a very common situation. You want to open the door. We are smart. We don't open the door by pushing on it close to the hinge. It's hard. That's why all doors have a doorknob at the end, at the edge of a door. Well, all right, so let's just do it. Hinge. 
is our axis because we told, told so. How do we calculate the torque? Well, case A. Well, first of all, I want to stress again that an official definition of the magnitude of a torque doesn't depend on what force is acting, what axis is chosen. It's always the same. That equation, equation tells us. Now, case, case A. We need to know two numbers, distance from the axis of rotation to the point of application, and uh, the component of the force, which is perpendicular to this distance. And in this situation, that component is equal to the force. So 5 times 9, 4.5. 4, 4. 4. 4. 4.5 what? The unit of distance is meters. The unit of force is newtons. So a unit of a torque is a newton times a meter. And if you remember, that was exactly the same unit for energy and work. But when we calculate energy or work, we called it joule. When we calculate torque, we just call it meters times newton. That's it. All right. Next ca uh, case, B. Same axis, new distance, but still perpendicular. So hence, the magnitude of a torque for case B will be equal to uh, one-third of 0 0.9 times 5, 1.5. <clears throat> and that might not be strong enough to uh, open that door if it has some springs, you know, which holds it. So that's why when we push closer, we have to apply a stronger force to overcome the same resistance. Case C, same axis, but uh, the force now points at 10 degrees from the door. So, hence, to calculate torque, we should use the distance from the axis of rotation, location, axis of rotation to the point of application, which is 0 0.9, and we have to multiply by <coughs> only the component of the force, that component which is perpendicular to this line, F, Y. For that, we have to look at the triangle, F, 5 newtons, angle 10 degrees, F, Y should be equal to hypotenuse times sine of that angle, 5 times sine of 10. And uh, you can finish it. Case D, same type of, type of a calculation, different distance, one-third of 0 0.9 times 5 times sine of 10 degrees. Wherever it is, it is. <coughs> I'm just going to start it. Uh, what would we... No, I'm going to stop it. So I'm going to pick up from this slide tomorrow. Thank you very much. But again, theoretically, you're ready to solve any problem related to torques and static equilibrium. You're ready now. Now you're ready.